Beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much to the uh, conference organizers for the opportunity to present um, the results of our study, which was um, funded by Power and Water and the joint project between Power Water, CDU, and uh, Menzies, and the um, title we've already heard. So, let's get this. Yes, here we are. So, um, high iron levels, that's a common issue in the top end and probably across whole Australia, and it has uh, mainly natural causes. And the Australian Water Drinking Guidelines stay state in a steady guideline of 0.3 milligram per litre of total iron, and some of the remote communities in the top end, they have an um, average one milligram per litre, so um, quite a bit more. So iron itself is not dangerous, it's just um, unpleasant, it has an unpleasant um, taste, and it um, stains close. And the, it's not that um, all of the iron is um, red or stains close, but it's actually mainly the insoluble ferric, the iron-3, which um, is red and which forms the brown deposits. And um, it is formed through the um, ferrous or from the ferrous um, iron-2 iron, through um, uh, or it's uh, formed spontaneously with oxygen, uh, the neutral to alkaline pH. However, what really drives the iron cycle are our iron bacteria. And so, um, the presence of oxygen, we have the iron oxidizing bacteria, which turn the ferrous to the ferric iron, and in the absence of um, oxygen, we have, for instance, our iron reducing bacteria, which turn the um, iron oxides back to the um, soluble iron two or the ferrous iron. But bacteria, these iron bacteria, they're not only involved in happily processing iron, but the problem is that they also form biofilms. And these biofilms, they block pipes, they um, contribute to pipe corrosion, they increase the chlorine demand, and they are also a reservoir for pathogens. Now, I could spend easily the next few hours talking about um, biofilms and factors which contribute to its formation and extent. So I just mentioned a few factors which are quite important. That's um, pipe surface, is it steel, is it copper, is it um, PVC, is it the level of corrosion, water flow is really important, organic matter, nutrients, phosphates, and pH and temperature. And um, in this graph, you just see a, a summary of how these biofilms um, develop over time, where you also see that the flow rate or the flow, the level of the flow very much changes, and also we get a nutrient gradient, and um, also parts of the biofilm can break off and then float um, as um, clumps or um, planktonic cells. And so with this picture, we also see that it's, um, we, we can see that pipes can get blocked, but how come that um, we talk about reservoir for pathogens when we talk about biofilms? And the reason is that um, the biofilms, they don't just then um, consist of bacteria, but the bacteria, they build this kind of fortress around them and, and in the form of um, extracellular matrix, which really protects them quite su successfully from stresses such as um, disinfection agents. And what we also see and often gets forgotten is that biofilms also contribute to the spread of antibiotic resistance genes. And that's more so because so many bacteria um, live together and also different bacteria live together in these biofilms that um, the genes can um, move around quite easily. Then what um, is also important is that amoeba, amoeba feed on biofilms and some of these amoeba are pathogenic themselves such as and Megleria foliary or some of the cant amoeba can cause cerebral or eye infections, but amoeba can also harbor pathogenic or potentially pathogenic bacteria, such as um, some of the Legionella or Mycobacteria. And then finally, of course, the biofilms can harbor opportunistic pathogens themselves, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Legionella immunophila or Mycobacterium avium. And Bach has already told us about um, meliodosis and Burkholderia pseudomite, which is um, really comparatively common in um, unchlorinated bore water in the top end. And as Bart has um, told us, meliodosis cases have occurred due to contaminated unchlorinated water. So, so far we know that B. pseudomyl is associated with more acidic, soft and iron-rich water. And we mainly associate it, apart from soil of course and plants, we associate it with um, surface water or the seasonal, the shallow aquifer. But at this stage, we actually still don't know whether they occur in the deeper aquifer at all. 
We also know that it is found in um, sludge aerators or filters of water distribution systems, so this is still the unchlorinated part. It's able to form biofilms, we know this mainly from patients, but we actually don't know how much this contributes to biofilm formation in the pipes. And we also know that some of the um, pseudomyelia are also um, able to survive in some amoeba. Okay, so, so far we know we've got um, high iron in some of the communities. We know there's um, potentially um, biofilms, there's potentially pathogens. So where do we go from here? So the objectives of our study were to characterize the microbial composition of biofilms and water in three remote water supplies in the top end, two with high and one with low iron content. Identify bacterial taxa which contain iron bacteria and analyze their association with nutrients. And then finally also measure um, fecal indicators and opportunistic pathogens such as E. coli, P. pseudomyelia, P. aeruginosa and Agleria cholerae in these samples. So our study approach was we've chosen, as I said, three remote communities. The two communities with high iron levels were Gambalania and Numbuwa, and the one with low was Veronyanga. In each community, we um, had five sites, so three unchlorinated sites, which were mainly the bores or unchlorinated tank, and two chlorinated sites from the retic. At each site, we collected water and biofilm and various um, abiotic factors or fiscan factors. And each sample we cultured for E. coli, Clostridium spores, P. aeruginosa, and Follery, and also B. pseudomyelae. Then we also did the microbial profiling. So this is looking at all the D or all the bacteria which were there. This is not dependent on culture, but um, it looks at the DNA of the water and the biofilm at um, sequencing through sequencing of um, a gene which is um, conserved in bacterial taxa. And we also measured the metals and the nutrients of the water. And here you see some pictures of um, the biofilms we collected. And we start with the ones on the far left. These are from Gambalania. <coughs> and they had, um, as we know, the, um, it is high in iron. And so these pictures are from a bore. And there was really a lot of um, iron oxide deposits and a lot of biofilms. Then in the middle, you can see a tank or pipe from um, Nambuwa where we also have um, iron oxide deposits and biofilm, but it's a different nature. Whereas the Varamyanga um, bore, it does look red, but it's actually sand in this case, so there wasn't that much biofilm. And then on the right-hand side, we can see um, a chlorinated um, sample where we had difficulties of getting any biofilm at all. So if we now come to the results and we start with our um, FISCAM, the abiotic factors, you see in your columns, you see all the different sites with um, number one on the left, Romyanga and Gambalania on the right hand side. And we, as um, I mentioned before, with the first three sites were unchlorinated and the next two chlorinated and they all had free chlorine levels above 0.5 milligrams per litre. What you can see here mainly is um, two things. Number one had um, way more salts. Uh, was more buffered the water and also um, accordingly the pH of the water in number one was way more um, neutral to even alkaline. Then we come to the DO, the dissolved oxygen. Um, always the bore water, the first three samples, they had a lower dissolved oxygen as you would expect coming from the groundwater which is low in oxygen. And the next one is our ORP, that's the oxidation redox potential. For those of you who are not um, familiar with redox, that indicates how oxidizing or reducing a substance is. So if we have a positive ORP, that means the um, substance tends to take electro electrons, or negative, it tends to give electrons. So we know that oxygen and chlorine are highly <coughs> oxidizing, so we're not surprised that our um, chlorinated samples from the retic, they had a higher redox levels. But what was quite interesting to see that overall number one had a far lower redox, a far more reducing environment than, for instance, Ramayanga and Gambalania. And um, reasons for this could, for instance, be that there were more organic carbons in number one water. And indeed, you can see here the nutrients and the blue um, row at the bottom shows the dissolved organic carbon. And as you can see, there was indeed more organic carbon in the number one water, and there was also more um, total dissolved nitrogen. And finally, we have our um, elements, the iron. So number one had by far the highest iron levels, with some of them um, bored up to um, 4.9 milligram per liter. And it also had um, way more um, major elements, such as magnesium uh, or um, potassium. 
And so this is um, probably due because the number one water is from a yes, ah uh, yes, it's from a num it's from a coastal um, aquifer um, deposit, and um, it is in a swampy area. Okay, so now we come to our um, bacteria results. So we start with the microbial profiling, which is just based on the DNA. And in this ordination, you see, um, so each dot is a sample, or each dot shows you the microbial fingerprint of a sample, and it's either biofilm or it's um, water, either chlorinated or not chlorinated. And what you can see is that the um, green squares, these are our non-chlorinated biofilm from number one, and the red one from Gambalania, and they really stand out. So this means they were really quite different. So the closer the dots, the more related the fingerprints were, and the further away, the more different they were. So it was possible to predict which remote communities a biofilm had come from based on the bacteria in that sample. However, the water microbiota was not that distinct, so we could see no significant difference between uh, or for a particular community. Um, we found that the bacteria in the water significantly differed from those in the biofilm, and to no surprise, the chlorinated and the non-chlorinated samples also had significantly different bacteria. But this was actually only mainly for the biofilm, so again, not really for the water, which was quite um, surprising. So when we look at the abiotic factors, which mostly explain the bacterial fingerprint, so this was, to no surprise, redox levels, dissolved oxygen and chlorine, but also manganese. But what is missing here is iron. And that's probably because we um, only looked at total iron and different bacteria associated with different iron species. So then, of course, we wanted to know um, what bacteria were there, actually. So here you can see the top 10 genera in the water distribution system at Waramianga. So we have the top left, the non-chlorinated water, then the chlorinated water, non-chlorinated biofilm, and the chlorinated biofilm. So I won't go into detail, but just show some of the more interesting <coughs> ones. So for instance, we had um, dichloromonas, which was um, enriched in the biofilm, the chlorinated biofilm, and also occurred in the water. And these um, bacteria have been found in other stud uh, studies to be abundant in chloraminated water, and they are involved in biodegradation of um, aromatic compounds. Then, um, which was quite interesting, especially one of the balls, mainly um, only consisted of ammonifilus. This is an endospore forming bacillus and feeds on an oxalates, and oxalates, they occur in plants or in wood rotting fungi. So, um, I'm not quite sure how this got into a bore. And when it comes to the chlorinated samples, we had um, Ralstonia, which was really prevalent in the um, chlorinated bi biofilm, and the Sinococcus in the chlorinated water. Now, the Ralstonia is hardy. It's a very hardy bacterium, and it has been described even in the space, in the water supply of the space shuttle, of the spaceships. And um, it is able to break down polymers from um, plastic piping. And yeah, it's definitely very abundant in the environment around here. So the Cococcus, on the other hand, is a cyanobacterium, and it has also been described in other chlorinated um, water distribution systems. Now, if we have a look at number one, Gambalania, again, we have Ralstonia. It's really um, present in our um, chlorinated um, biofilms and the Sinecococcus in the water again. We have now also our um, interesting um, iron and sulfur related bacteria. So for instance, magnetospirillum is magnetotactic, so it aligns with the magnetic field. It forms iron oxide deposits. And theothrix, which we also found in number one, oxidizes sulfate and it contributes to biofouling. Then what was really interesting was to see that um, Gallionella occurred in high levels at Galli uh, in Gambalania. And Gallionella is, um, very well, is a very well-known iron bacterium. It's probably one of the best described iron bacterium which there is. And it um, oxidizes um, uh, iron. And so it's very much contributing to the iron oxide deposits we see in Gambalania. So the question then, of course, was why is there so much Gallionella in um, Gambalania but not in number one? And Gallinella preferred slightly acidic conditions, which was the case for Gambalania, whereas Nambawa had a more um, neutral to alkaline conditions. <coughs> and Gambalania water, bore water was also more oxidizing, whereas the Nambawa water was probably too reducing for um, Gallinella, and Nambawa accordingly had more iron reducers such as Chevanella or Geothrix. And there was also more organic carbon in Nambawa for, um, for this iron reducing bacteria. So all up, 
we had a look now at the um, DNA, at the bacteria, which we found by, um, by microbial profiling. And now, um, my second last slide, we have a look at the culture of opportunistic pathogens. And none of the samples grew E. coli nor Negleria foliary. And none of the chlorinated retic samples grew any of the tested opportunistic pathogens. The non-chlorinated tank in number one had a lot of bacteria in general, coliforms, pierobinosa, um, uh, Clostridia spores and amoeba, but that was probably due to generally good growth conditions in this tank due to the neutral pH and lots of nutrients. And also the water, as I said earlier, in number one comes from an unconfined shallow aquifer. We did find these pseudomali in three unchlorinated samples. We found it in a bore in number one, which obviously is an iron rich, slightly acidic, and it had only low counts of other bacteria. And we also found it in the water as well as in the biofilm in Gambalania, which is also <coughs> iron rich, had again quite low heterotrophs, and this sample also contained amoeba. We were a bit surprised that this was actually a deeper aquifer. So the question is whether the aquifer itself is actually positive or whether there has been a leak in the borehead where it entered. So the conclusions are that despite high iron levels in the water for both number one and Gambalania, we found different populations of um, iron bacteria in each due to differences in the redox, pH and nutrients. And we found that the chlorinated biofilms in general showed a marked decrease in bacterial diversity and they were dominated by the hardy Alstonia and the water by the cyanobacterium Cynococcus. And as we knew before, see pseudomyl is often associated with surface water intrusion, slightly acidic and iron rich water, but not always, as we've seen with this positive um, bore in um, Gambalania. And there we also um, get more and more an idea that there's no linear relationship between how many other bacteria you find in a sample, which is often used as an indicator for whether there are opportunistic pathogens there or not. But B. pseudomyl is such a hardy bacterium which also thrives under nutrient limiting conditions. For instance, it can survive in distilled water for 20 years. That you, um, yeah, it can survive where other bacteria don't grow anymore. So all up, we need to know still more, we need to know more about biofilm dynamics and the association with opportunistic pathogens and the occurrence of B. pseudomyl in deeper and semi-confined aquifers. And yes, I would like to thank all these people who were also involved.